everyone. Before we go on the record, can I see the lawyers at sidebar real quick? Judge the photographer.
Let's go ahead and bring Ms. Williams out for a minute. Ms. Williams, good afternoon. If you go ahead and take your place at council table, make yourself as comfortable as possible. We're here this afternoon in the matter of state versus Brianna Williams as president along with Mr. Beard, her council, council for the state. Uh, Ms. Anderson and Mr. Hutton are also present. This is 19 CF 11711, case 48 on the calendar. The matter was passed to today uh, to permit the court to review items that were submitted for its consideration at the second day uh, of the hearing. After conferring with council, I, uh, of course, committed to review all of the evidentiary exhibits that were submitted. There were in excess of 125 for the state approximately seven for the defense. I've reviewed them all, some in the company of counsel, and some in my chambers. So that the record is clear, I have reread the pre-sentence investigation report subject to the objections that were raised by Mr. Beard. I've read the defendant's uh, transcripts from secondary school in their entirety and I'm familiar with their content. I've read the defendant's entire uh, packet of military records submitted for my review, that's Defendant's Exhibit 2, uh, including all of the efficiency reports uh, submitted by those who were responsible for her supervision in the Navy. Uh, I've read the Clinical Psychological, excuse me, Clinical Psychology Associates of North Florida report in its entirety uh, as prepared by Dr. Bordini, that's Defendant's 1. Um, I have read again for a second time the report of osteological examination uh, submitted for the court's consideration and at the request of counsel. I have also read the deposition of December 6, 2021 uh, taken of Heather Walsh Haney, PhD, um, regarding the analysis of the bones recovered at the crime scene. Having considered all these items, uh, I spoke with the state and the defense at sidebar prior to you being brought out, Ms. Williams, and so I won't keep you in the dark about anything I ever say uh, to your attorney or to the state. Um, I discussed some, some real questions I have regarding the law, but I'm going to put those on the record here in just a moment. Uh, they may be inconsequential, but I wanted to warn the lawyers that they may be raised, and once they become part of the record, they may be an issue that the lawyers can help me with at some future date. Uh, but regardless, I'm prepared to go forward with sentencing today. It's important uh, that we recall that the guideline range is 20.5 to life. The defense has argued for a minimum guideline sentence, uh, recognizing that there's no legal basis to deviate below the guidelines. They requested that the court impose a sentence of 20.5 years. The state is seeking life. Sentencing is difficult for any judge. It's particularly difficult in a case like this. Um, I've examined the mitigation that has been offered by the defendant. It's important to recall that we are here today on a sentence for second degree murder. The defendant was originally charged with a series of crimes involving child abuse or neglect, uh, as well as uh, essentially providing false information to law enforcement. Those were dropped in light of the plea to the pending charge. Um, she's not charged with those any longer, although child abuse and neglect became relevant uh, her lying to the police became relevant, uh, and, but I'm not fashioning the sentence in light of that. They are taken into consideration, and I just want everyone to be aware that my focus is only on what the law allows me to be focused on, which is the second degree murder itself. Uh, therefore, what she did after the death and the desecration of the body, again, is relevant only for fashioning an appropriate sentence related to the homicide itself. In considering the mitigation, the defendant has no criminal history. Uh, which is unusual, um, but that is taken into consideration. I say it's unusual because it's not uncommon in this court for those who appear before uh, me to have a criminal history uh, when violent crimes are involved, but in this case, no criminal history. I reviewed the academic record. Uh, she has high achievement and she did accomplish certain things at the high school level in spite of difficult family circumstances, and I, I recognize that and take it into consideration. I've reviewed her military history. Uh, she volunteered to serve and served honorably. The 
reviews that I received uh, regarding her performance from those responsible for uh, overseeing her work uh, were all outstanding. They recommended early promotion in every one. She served well. In spite of that, I heard evidence at the sentencing hearing regarding collateral behavior, behavior outside of uh, her specific military duties, uh, involvement with other sailors uh, that's potentially prosecutable as a crime in the military under Article 134 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And so while she's got exemplary service, um, she's also carrying on other relationships that are subject to potential criminal prosecution in the Navy, and all of those things were considered in determining whether it was a mitigating factor. Dr. Bernini's testimony was considered um, as well. Uh, her family history included uh, a mother and father who were unmarried at the time of her birth, uh, a father who was not part of her life, an uh, active part of her life until late high school, a mom who was not actually raising her. She was raised by extended family and the family environment was unstable and there was a resulting allegations of abuse. That's also tragically common for those that appear before me. It, the evidence offered by Dr. Bedini was not offered as justification, but as a way of explanation, and the court accepts it as such. He acknowledged that his opinions are based on objective analysis as well as subjective opinions. Uh, that's why he's an expert. Multiple diagnoses were rendered, um, and the court has taken all of those, uh, all that testimony into consideration. One of the things that the court asked was whether or not the diagnoses and findings were descriptive or predictive, and he said both, meaning that it provided a context for the crime, but also uh, it would continue to persist, which means that given the right circumstance, uh, it creates concerns for me regarding danger to the community. To the extent she might find herself in circum similar circumstances with ongoing uh, psychiatric issues uh, that are unresolved, it creates the possibility for a repeat offense. The court takes that into consideration. Beyond that, there was not additional mitigation offered for the court's consideration of any consequence. The state offered essentially an aggravation the circumstances surrounding the crime itself in light of the relationship that the defendant had with the victim, her daughter. The court heard testimony over several days regarding the substance of the investigation. There was no opinion regarding cause of death. There could be no expert opinion because the defendant disposed of the body in such a way that it prevented any analysis that would result in an expert opinion. That does not mean that the court cannot draw its own conclusions. And so based on the following factors, uh, I'll tell you the conclusion that I believe most appropriate. Again, in considering the allegations of second degree murder, the evidence before the court is that the victim was not valued from the time of conception by either her father or mother, that her mother suffered the defendant from an eating disorder, that the father complained that uh, the victim was not being properly fed, the defendant then removed the victim from daycare approximately four months to the victim prior to the victim's death. Uh, Taylor remained home alone and unprovided for throughout that time period. There was no significant purchase of groceries during that time period. There were some fast food purchases, but no more. No significant food in the home or the apartment. The food present in the refrigerator was unfit to eat. There's a hole in a juice can from which, well, there's a hole from a fruit can from which juice could be consumed. That was an argument made by the state, and that is supported by the record. There were photos submitted for the court's consideration, and I did notice a change in the child's appearance, particularly immediately surrounding the time of death. She appeared small and as if she were losing weight. Again, we have no opinion regarding the cause of death because the defendant acted in a way that prevented that review. According to her testimony, she found Taylor Rose slumped over in a closet. 
unresponsive uh, and she knew that she was dead. Thereafter, the defendant failed to report the death of her daughter. She then lied to law enforcement repeatedly over the course of the investigation in order to conceal what she had done, which was to transport the body out of state and dispose of the body, which this court construes as a consciousness of guilt. When the bones uh, of Taylor Rose were analyzed, they were consistent with malnutrition. There is evidence in the record then to draw a reasonable inference that although firearms were present and blood splatter was documented in the bathroom, uh, the death was in all probability a consequence of starvation. There was a failure to act where you have a duty to act. You had a duty to provide care for your child, including the provision of food, and over the course of a four-month period failed to do so, resulting in her death. Coming now to the sentence, if you please stand with your attorney. Considering the aggravating and the mitigating factors, uh, wanting to ensure that the community is protected and that a sentence is rendered in a way that does not dishonor the death of Taylor Rose, the court sentences you to life in prison. Madam Clerk, can you give me credit for time served, please? Yeah, 1,043 days, Judge. 1,043 days, credit for time served. You'll pay 600, correct that. Madam Clerk, is it 518? 518, Your Honor, 150. 518 and $150 public defender fee. Are you asking me to convert it to a civil judgment? Yes, sir. I'll convert the matter to a civil judgment. Yes. Ms. Williams, I take no pleasure in pronouncing the sentence. You have 30 days from today's date to take an appeal to the sentence if you believe the portion to be illegal. If you can't afford an attorney for that purpose, I'll appoint the public defender to represent you. It's a tragedy all the way around. I wish the families well. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? We're adjourned. Thank you all. Just one moment. Before we take her out, just one moment, Mr. Beard. Uh, Madam Clerk, yes, I want to make sure that I adjudicate the defendant guilty rather than just pronounce a sentence. Did I adjudicate her guilty? No, Judge. That's essential. <laughs> I thought I missed that part. Let's go ahead and bring her back so that the record is clear. Ms. Williams, if you'd step back to the podium, please. I moved right into the sentence, forgetting that the jury, this is not a jury trial, but a plea. I adjudicate you guilty in light of your plea. I find a factual basis to support the plea. In light of the adjudication of guilt for second degree murder, I sentence you to life in prison with credit for 1,013 days time served. You'll pay 518 in court costs and a $150 public defender fee. I've converted it to a civil judgment. You have 30 days from today's date to take an appeal to the sentence if you believe any portion to be illegal. If you can't afford an attorney for that purpose, I'll appoint a public defender. Thank you. 1,043, I beg your pardon. 1,043 days time, sir. Thank you all. Now, anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from Mr. Beard? You've all been helpful. Thank you. We're adjourned.